This is Anime Archaeology Station, broadcasting anime analysis to anyone who will listen. We have a basement archive full of an ever-growing collection of anime media. We tell you about it and explain the terms and tropes behind this unique medium. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the broadcast. I hope you're having a good day wherever you happen to be right now. And I hope you've been enjoying Anne of Green Gables. We'll be getting to our analysis of episode two of that here in a little bit. Uh, otherwise, I apologize if I'm a little scatterbrained today. As I mentioned last time, we have this uh, Arts and Culture Festival coming up here pretty soon. And I've been asked to go to that, And but I need to make sure the tower is okay while I'm gone. Uh, thankfully, there's a local girl who has been getting into anime, and uh, she's volunteered to take care of the tower while I'm away. Uh, and the reason I'm a little bit frazzled is because I'm trying to document everything that needs to happen to keep the broadcast tower broadcasting. And uh, that's just a lot of stuff I probably should have documented, you know, years ago. So I'm in the middle of doing all of that, but don't worry, we'll get there. Uh, I do want to talk about the staff of Anne of Green Gables before we get into it, though, because there's some interesting notes there. So uh, let's head downstairs and do that. All right, here we are back down in the research room, starting with a staff spotlight on Anne of Green Gables, some of the major folks involved in the making of this anime series. And we'll start off with the director, Isao Takahata. Now, Takahata is best known for Grave of the Fireflies, and that's kind of unfortunate in the sense that because Grave has such this Grave reputation that I think people see him as somebody who makes really dark, sad, hard-to-take anime. Um, it really limits the amount of folks that, that, uh, that actually watch his stuff. And don't get me wrong, Grave of the Fireflies is an amazing film, but he's done so many other things that are so much lighter, so much more um, uh, uplifting than Grave of the Fireflies is. And not that Grave of the Fireflies is sad throughout, but uh, you, you, know, you know what I mean. If you've ever seen Grave or you know his reputation. Uh, Takahata was a brilliant, brilliant director and understander of animation at a kind of molecular level. He understood a lot about how to make animation work. And you see this a lot in how he adapted Anne of Green Gables, where he decided to go with a much more realistic style. We'll get to that here in a second. Um, Takahata, as I said, has a huge list of, of anime he's done. He directed Horace, Prince of the Sun, and Heidi Girl of the Alps before Anne of Green Gables. And after this, he'd go on to do not only Grave of the Fireflies, but also stuff like The Tale of Princess Kaguya, which is a remarkable film, very diverse film in terms of animation styles, very symbolic too. So um, I definitely encourage you to check out other Takahata's works if you like this stuff at all. Um, point being, here was somebody who definitely had a lot of experience behind him and was very much applying it to Anne of Green Gables. Uh, also working on this was a guy named Hayao Miyazaki, who you've probably heard of. Um, he assisted with scene setting and layout. This means figuring out what would be in a scene and how the different characters would be laid out in a scene, right? So if you were in the kitchen of the Cuthbert home of Green Gables, uh, what would be kind of the camera angle? Who would be in the, you know, in frame at any given time? So kind of storyboarding was a lot of what he was doing on this particular anime. Now he left after about 15 episodes. Um, he was getting busy with other stuff like Castle Cagliostro. Um, he'd been working on the Paul III. Uh, so working on the uh, Cagliostro film, and then of course that led to a lot of his other uh, films. So he's not in it throughout, but definitely very, very much a part of the beginning of this work. And Miyazaki himself noted a difference in Takahata's philosophy of animation with this compared to some of his other works. Takahata stuck to controlled, realistic acting in this. And you see this a lot in Anne of Green Gables, where the characters don't run and leap and do the kinds of kind of over-the-top movement that you see in anime. Even uh, anime aimed at children, we tend to have a lot of um, 
of extreme movements in there. I think of the characters that kind of leap 15 feet in the air from a standstill, right? You don't see that in Anne. Very controlled, very realistic. Um, this is something he had done before in works like Heidi, but not so much in stuff like Horse Prince of the Sun and some of his other works. So definitely an artistic choice here to be very grounded in that. Miyazaki noted that as, as being remarkable. Also working on this anime was Yoshifumi Kondo, who uh, went on to become a veteran of Studio Ghibli. Um, he was the character designer, so if you like the character designs of Anne of Green Gables, that's the person to, to um, thank. Uh, also the animation director, so basically the person responsible for looking at all the animation and making sure it's consistent and that all the different shots are working together and visually correct. Um, he would later work with Takahata on films like Grave of the Fireflies and Only Yesterday. Uh, he also directed Whisper of the Heart at Studio Ghibli, so one of my personal favorite Ghibli films. Uh, he sadly passed away not long after Whisper of the Heart came out. Um, so unfortunately we don't get to see a lot of what he would have gone on to do, but uh, um, definitely a major hand in Anne of Green Gables. Obviously a bunch of other staff involved here. Many of them were folks who worked mostly on World Masterpiece Theater and other children's animation of the 70s and 80s. So if you look at that, that staff there. Uh, and then voice actors who, again, were working mostly in that period, 70s, 80s kind of voice actors. Uh, a lot of them who worked on other children's literature adaptations. So there's not a, a lot of huge connections between Anne of Green Gables and other like famous anime in the anime medium in general. This is kind of more focused in that children's lit area, except for these guys. So uh, certainly notable, and uh, those are kind of the, the big ones I wanted to call out about Anne of Green Gables. So hope you found that useful. Let's go on back upstairs. All right, hope you found that useful. We're gonna get into the analysis here in a second. I'm actually, I'm, I'm getting there with the documentation. So I've got a, a binder full of documents and I'm, I'm building up. So I think we'll be, we'll be good. Got a bunch more to write, but um, let's get into the analysis here in a second. I got Steve on standby. A few things to watch out for in this episode of Anne. Um, check out how the staff shows you the emotional reactions of the characters through their facial expressions. And particularly facial expressions you might not be used to seeing in anime. Um, look out for how Marilla and Matthew might fare as parents, what they're doing to either nurture and provide boundaries or not. Uh, and also look at how the characters are like literally physically positioned on screen relative to each other and what that tells us about their inner attitudes. So, uh, yeah, let's get Steve on the line and look at Anne episode two. All right, Steve, looks like we have got you keyed in. How are things going up there? Oh, not too bad, not too bad. We've had a nice case of vacuum tubes that haven't been used yet, so... Uh, Great. Thank goodness we had them. Cool. <laughs> yep. so I can be here. Awesome. You never use too many vacuum tubes. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, let's get into... And episode two, I'm sure this will be very heartwarming and not sad at all. <laughs> Please. Please. So it's worth noting here uh, that we have the um, reminder of what happened in the last episode. Again, this is a time before VHS tapes, before any of that. I mean, they existed, but like widespread home video recording was not right. a thing yet. So these shows basically had to remind you of where they were in the story. Did we have that shot? I think this is Did new. We have? Yeah, um, I was going to say, I don't remember that shot. Yeah, I think we've come back. So we got like two sentences of summary and we're right back to storyline. But also note here, these birds are being shown in like a, a mauve, like light purple color. Yeah. But then when they duck down a little bit further, they turn white. Oh, yeah. They do. And they just all switch white right there in the center of the screen. I'm not sure why they do that, because it's, if anything, they're harder to see now. Yeah. Um, like, with that yellow behind them, you'd think you'd stay that color. I wonder if this is either animation they're planning to use in multiple places... And so they just know they want to do that. Or it is to remind... 
No. I was thinking, could it be literally the light because we're at dusk? Um, the light's hitting them differently right. because they're kind of above <clears throat> or below. That's possible. I don't know. But that is an odd animation detail because it's very deliberate. Like they, you, Somebody had to go in there and say, okay, yeah. at frame 28, change the paint to this color. Huh? I'm not sure why. Unless it's more symbolism again of remember, and right. going from like the, the dress color to the white that she's transitioning more to safety. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. This is completely new. Um, yeah. Because this is the Lake of Shining Waters. Yeah, wow. Why do you think she's enjoying the trembling feeling of the the uh, wheels on the wooden bridge? It's <clears throat> probably reflective of what she's feeling. Yeah. Um, true. You know, you know, excitement. It's... um. You know, it's it seems to be just a new uh, just a new sensation. Honestly, it's probably something that she doesn't know, and she's finding enjoyment enjoyment in it. You know, there's motion, there's movement, and it's something that in her previous life is is you know everything is stolid gray and no motion. So maybe this this is this is part of it. Um, one of the things I noticed on the bridge is that they actually did the detail of facing planks the wrong way, or not the wrong True. way, but a different way mm -hmm. to show that, that the wheels go over a certain part of the bridge. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, I think you're absolutely right, yeah. And the tough thing here is you have to animate both the reflection and mm -hmm. the real thing. So this is them spending the money. Oh, yes. Oh, wow, look at that. I mean, as simple as it is, it is just such a lovely shot. And again, yes. like we were saying before, they have the little ripples in the water just to add enough visual interest that it's not just a painting, although the painting would be plenty. <laughs> yeah, no joke. And to our earlier point, Takahata is, A, giving us time to breathe, giving us time to experience the moment. Right. But also, this is what Anne is experiencing, is this, this quiet moment. So we get to feel that with her. Um, you know, it would be easy for somebody to just keep on talking, keep the dialogue running. Right. And we're back in Fantasia again. <laughs> I wonder, I'm looking at this, and I'm wondering if, like, what these are are the, are the whippoorwill bugs that you see over oh, like some stuff that yeah. like, go that and so that her mind just kind of goes click and they're little fairies that are touching touching the water that's a great point I think you're absolutely right um, and the whole scene is about showcasing her imagination of you know the girl yeah. living over the, the lake yeah that makes a lot of sense you also notice we cut from that to just another nature shot um, pointing yeah. out that she's <clears throat> not um, you know, she doesn't fall completely into these reveries necessarily. It's just her mind makes all these associations so quickly. It's also important here that Takahara is pushing in on Anne's face. So often that's used <coughs> just to add visual interest, just to kind of, you know, um, just to do it. But this does such a great job of bringing you into Anne's world, you know, making you yeah. realize that she is just completely absorbed in this moment. And note Matthew's response here is, it's not we have to go. It's a gentle reminder of we'll be late if we don't move now, waits for her to acknowledge that and then moves on. Um, yeah. He's not giving up any responsibility. He's just, you know, pointing out a thing and then you know, responding to that thing but very respectful. This back and forth is obviously comedy where she mentions a thrill, he talks about seeing grubs, but note the adultness of the conversation, right? Where they're treating each other as equals in the conversation. They can disagree. Um, you know, th there's, right. it's very much grown from that earlier, like Matthew doesn't quite know how to deal with her. Interesting. All right, so here we get our first indication of the religiousness of the community. Um, something that 
a lot of Japanese directors, I think, would shy away from. Um, right. But I think they do a really good job of layering in the fact that, you know, naming somebody after a Greek goddess is a little, you know, going a little far to some people in the community. <laughs> Interesting. Well, one of the things that, that you know, as they're having this, this back and forth here about mm -hmm. the name, <clears throat> yeah. the girl's name, one of the things that you should know is just like, oh, Anne's literate. <laughs> yes, true. Great point. <laughs> right? You know, she's she knows what that is. Most mm -hmm. kids would probably not know what that is. So that means that she has some type of an education. Mm -hmm. Great point. <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> <laughs> and just love the expression on Matthew there. But also in general, the... Just capriciousness of Anne here is very cute. Yeah. All right, now they do this fun little trick here to telegraph what Green Gables was. Because right, she looks forward, and we go to the right, and we go back to the left, and it just happens to be at the far end of the left where we're going to go on back and forth. Yeah. So you're expecting it at that point, but it lets the audience in on that feeling that Anne has of recognizing Green Gables. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a neat thing, you know, where it's like, uh, okay, you know, you, you got to figure out some way of doing it. And I remember when I first saw that, uh, I, I thought, oh, yeah, that must be Green Gables. You know, it, it works. Yeah. yeah. Oh, dear God, I feel the type. Oh, stop <laughs> twisting. Stop <laughs> twisting. Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Those two expressions just perfectly sum up both of these characters at this moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, to that point, that's actually really smart visual storytelling. We have all of this ups and downs of Anne's emotions and so forth. And the last close up we end on perfectly caps encapsulates their you know, feelings so that when we now move to Green Gables, we know the emotional stakes of that. Right. And again, just see how much they're just letting this play out. No dialogue, no music, just we're slowly moving up to that house, making the audience wonder what's going to happen. Like, yeah. how is this going to, you know, we know it's not going to end perfectly, probably. <laughs> <laughs> also note the detail here. Um, note which windows have lights in them. Right. Just the ones on the ground floor in the, what would presumably be like the living room, kitchen, dining, you know, the, the, the area where you're welcoming guests. So we know they're still expecting Anne. Well, <laughs> expecting Matthew. <laughs> a boy. <laughs> yeah, a <right>. boy. <laughs> yes. I do really appreciate here how you get, they stop and you hear the sound of the wind in the trees. The wind, it, yeah. And Anne notices it too. Uh, but you also just see her looking around and just that sensation of being in this new place and her trying to absorb it is very strong. And at this point, I feel like the audience has enjoyed thoroughly the first episode of just going from A to B. Yeah. <laughs> you know, going from, you know, from there and just going up in the ups and downs. And you realize we all know what's going to happen next, right? Yeah. We all know what's going to happen as soon as they walk into the door. So you're kind of feeling like almost like, no, 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 Matthew, get back in the thing, get back in the buggy, and let's just keep going, just keep yeah. going, just, just go, just go. Uh -huh. We want to, we want to, want that happy joy, joy back and forth, you know, going. But we know we have to move forward, and it's just kind of like mm -hmm. <clears throat> the trees are are like almost as as if trying to warn Anne of just like, like, all right, here you go, <laughs> you know, yeah. be careful with what you wish for. Mm -hmm. Hundred percent. Okay, so initial reaction from Marilla. They don't beat around the bush here. You know, her first reaction is, who's that? Where's the boy? Right. You know, not like, oh, hi. You know, um, why don't you have a seat over here? Let me talk to Matthew for a moment. No, it's, it's very much a blunt, who the F are you? Yeah. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's just like, uh, hi. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, n n you're absolutely right. Not addressing Anne at all. It's entirely to Matthew. Yeah, yeah. There we go. 
Yeah. There is Anne's immediate reaction. She knows exactly what the implications are of this. And it should also be noted here, her reaction is effectively shock. Uh, she's not complaining that she's not being talked to. Right. She's not flying off the handle. She's just processing. What does Anne do? She looks at Matthew. Right. You know, you're the adult. You need to fix this. <laughs> yeah. Or not, not even so, so much, but just like, you're the nice adult. Can you fix this? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we know already that Anne is, um, um, has had a lot of difficulties with, <laughs> with, with yeah. some of her experiences. Uh -huh. But like, she's like, eh, uh, can you please do something here? Or at least explain something or what? Oof. Yeah. Now, Matthew is, in a sense, doing his best here, right? We'll yeah. We'll ask what's going on, and he explains. He is, you know, going through the situation, and then he's like, well, you know. It should also be pointed out, um, yeah, this is not a day, an era of cell phones. So he saw Anne there. He's like, well, either I leave her at the station for whatever hours there might be there, or I just take her home and, you know, at least there's some place she can be. You know, I'm not going to abandon the little right. girl in, out of nowhere. Um, so it's not an unreasonable thing for him to do because there's just no information for him to work off of. Right. And just her, you know, her initial response of all this as if she's furniture and not really there, yeah. <clears throat> you know, and kind of when we go back in the first episode we're, and we're realizing that the whole reason why they want a boy to begin with is so that he can do the work. Mm -hmm. And so would she have treated the boy like this as well? Or maybe talked around the boy or mm -hmm. whatever? Mm -hmm. You know, you know. she's not really coming off as somebody who wants a kid. Right. Like, like this is not a, I want to adopt a child to love and nurture and grow. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a practicality that she's working through and she's treating it as such. And Matthew is just kind of coming from this angle of just like going, well, I don't know what else to do. What you, what did you want me to do? Leave her in the elements, yeah. right? <laughs> and and you know, and he's just, but he's in his own way, kind of being like the only adult in the room, where he's just like, I'm not going to leave her there. I had to bring her home, yeah. and this is what happened. And you know what? We're just going to have to work this. Mm -hmm. And and you know, poor Anne is is is. Thin standing there just like I know the scene kind of and I just had this wonderful ride in I really want to be here I want to I want to I want to I want to and then this woman is just like I don't even know who you are I'm not even addressing you Matthew what's going on here why, why did you do this and she's and you know and it's just like she can already see herself going back on the train right it, it's yeah. an immediate you are not wanted yes yeah yeah mm. I love the symbolism here where, on the one hand, this is kind of loss of control of the body, um, but also this is what you do when you come home, right? You right. put your baggage down. So there's kind of that dual symbolism where that's clearly not what she's intending, but it's also playing off of this should be her home. Right. There we are. Yep. And that self-awareness, right, that... Not only is she, and she is understanding the situation, but also immediately taking it personally, right? Um, well, yeah. Look at how she's holding her hands, like you know, and it gets her please. please, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, and again, to, to your point, you think back on that whole carriage ride, and how good she's felt up to this point, and how accepting she's felt, and how Matthew has been treating her like an equal. And now suddenly all that has been just completely pulled out from under her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, she connects with the actual reason. She's, she's not dumb. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, twisting the knife <sighs> even, even further. But again, you know, we have not gotten much about her backstory up to this point. She's referred to the right. withered tree and so forth. And you, you get those senses. But there hasn't been this direct connection to this idea that nobody ever wanted her. Um, mm. So it's kind of all coming out here. 
Now, from a psychological perspective, we see what's happening here is catastrophizing. Um, mm-hmm. you know, she, she gets this rejection, and the result is, well, A, um, you know, it's bound to happen, and B, because something good happened to me, something bad should happen as well. Right. There's this very sort of corrupted view of herself because, you know, she's not had the, the most uplifting of, of childhoods. On the one hand, this is tragic. Right. Um, and I'm literally getting a little emotional looking at this. Um, on the other hand, it is also histrionic, right? It is also yeah. this extreme response to something, which is what kids do on the one hand. Right. Um, but also it's getting across the, the, this effect that Anne is, um, has a certain fragility to her, her soul. Um, right. If, if she is treated this way, she feels it extremely strongly. Um, yeah. She doesn't have, to be honest, she doesn't have an emotional, a well-balanced emotional center. Right. She's going, this is your fault. Yep. I mean, <laughs> this is what you like. Somehow you screwed up. This is yep. your fault. Mm-hmm. What are you doing here? This is, I can't have this. Yeah. I can't have this in my house. What is this? What is this? What's going on here? I don't know. This is a woman who should not have a child. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, her her, her uh, neighbor was right. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and Matthew is <clears throat> he's feeling it very keenly, I think, yeah. and <clears throat> he's desperately trying to figure out what to do and he you can you know that he likes Anne. i mean we we, we that that relationship has been established yeah. and in the meanwhile neither one of them has said anything she's about to clearly but mm-hmm. they haven't said anything yet but all you hear is Anne's whimpering and you're just like and i think it's intentional for this sound and for this look for the audience to look at this and goes please somebody effing say something please make this stop exactly i don't want this to keep going because mm-hmm. it, it's it's hurting and and please do absolutely something. and to that point you know you have a literal whimpering child on your table yeah what are the adults doing a staring contest yeah you know matthew should be doing something about Anne. Uh, if not just putting a, a hand on her shoulder or something right uh, marilla should be doing something to address it no 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 like that 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 is a detail to this situation Oof. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. So this is very much the kind of tone of the original book, where there's a certain um, commentary by the author on how well or poorly the characters are handling a situation. <laughs> I just love that Marilla stepped lamely into the breach. <laughs> yes. Just to point out that, well, she's going to do something. <laughs> So her first attempt at care is to essentially deny Anne's feelings. Yes. That this is not a big deal. Mm -hmm. And this is coming from a self-centered place because Marilla wanted the boy. Yeah. Marilla is not crying that she doesn't have a boy because Marilla has options. Marilla can send the girl back and try again. Anne does not have that ability. To, Anne doesn't get to try again. Mm-hmm. Anne gets to get sent away. If yeah. <laughs> This could be a short anime if Anne gets sent away. But <laughs> we know she's not. But yeah. Marilla's point is just like, I, I'm, not, I'm not upset about this. There's no reason why you should be upset about this. It's, not, it's, a, it's a mistake. It's not your fault. Maybe that's what she's trying to get at. But yeah. still, it's like, <clears throat> not what you say to a crying child. Mm-hmm. And so Anne's response is almost really appropriate like it is. yes there is a need <laughs> and in fairness the, the, the exact line is there's no need to cry so about it yeah um point being marilla is not saying you know i do not allow you to have any emotional reaction she's basically saying you know this is over the top which to your point is not what you say to a emotionally distraught child <laughs> yes <laughs> right like she she's allowed to to have this 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 reaction also notice how they draw this how they add kind of the smudges around her eyes mm-hmm. um very simple effect all things considered but it just adds that level of the fact that she's um she's been crying and she has her uh you know her eyes on her sleeve which is a little dirty and it's it just 
it adds a lot to the scene. Um, you also notice, to, like, kind of to your point, not only is this, is this a very appropriate response, notice how Anne is treating this adult who nominally has a lot of power over her. She is like responding, no, 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 I'm going to correct you on this. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's not quite mature, but it's, it's kind right. of this, this defense of herself. To that point, here's my little theory. Um, because Anne grew up in an orphanage, and as we later find out, there wasn't a lot of, and her other experiences didn't give her a lot of advocates, so to speak. Anne has always had to be her own parent. She's had to advocate for herself and defend herself in any situations that arise. And you don't see like specific situations of that in her past, but you can easily surmise that if she right. got bullied or whatever, she had to stand up for herself. That's what she's doing here. She is being her own mother, really, to Marilla, of saying, you know, here is what this child is going through. And then Takahata adds a, a, a little bit of humor by having her mispronounced tragic as tragical, uh, yes. which just lightens the mood slightly just enough to kind of give us a, a breath from... Yeah, it's just oh, from us going, I'm crying, I'm crying. <laughs> and Marilla gets a little bit of a smile, right? Um, which tells us a couple of things, right? It tells us that, A, Marilla is able to see the humor in a situation, so she's not heartless. Um, but it also tells her tells us that she's maybe not quite connecting emotionally with her still. Um, but it further um, points out that Anne talking back to Marilla did not cause Marilla to, like, slap her or spank her. Right. You know? Um, she was She's, like, you know, probably inappropriate for a child to do, but I'm not freaking out right now. Yeah. Now, this is very mild comfort. Yeah. But I suppose she is... Trying? Yeah, she's trying. She's doing all she can. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I forgot. I assumed that they knew, her, that he knew her name. Oh, my goodness. Oh. With all the words that came out of her mouth, <laughs> her name was not one of them. Yeah. It's, it's, oh, boy. She's <laughs> <laughs> like, dumbass. <laughs> uh, and again, you know, setting up, what is the relationship between these two? <clears throat> How good parents are they going to be? Right. Like, clearly there's, uh, there's some, some tension. I'd forgotten about this. <laughs> He asked, she asked her name. Will you please call me Cordelia? I, mm, this, this is, I love this. All right, a couple of things here. Uh, first off, her imagination is immediately, you know, flying off. Um, tears are gone. Um, but also, this idea that underscoring her desire to be a different person. Yeah, it's kind of like a like coping, you know, like her her mind is just like literally just like okay, you just went through this old thing. Yeah. You are disturbed or not disturbed, but upset, yeah. distressed. Yeah. And so we're just going to okay, we're going to go into fantasy mode. Please call me Cordelia. And when you stop and think about it, there's a certain logic to it to a kid. Hey, I'm not going to be here. Mhm. Mm Okay, they just told me I'm gonna stay the night. If I'm gonna be here one night and I have a chance to be called something, let me be called. Let me have something. Yeah, let me have something. Mm -hmm. You know, so call me Cordelia. Yeah, yes. And as they make, make make clear, like she's been thinking about this, right? She, she yeah. What would be her <clears throat> What would be her ideal name? So, which again tells us more things. A, what kind of kid sits around thinking about alternate names for themselves? I mean, we probably all had that those moments, but the fact that that right. kind of rushes back to her. And that she just wants to think about, wants to jump onto, and to, to your point, coping mechanism of, well, at least I can get th this one thing I've always wanted. There you go. Yep. You're absolutely right. That, that's her entire goal here. And I think this gets more to Marilla, 
you know, the most practical character in the room. Um, romance is just not part of her existence. Right. Now, this is interesting kind of psychologically, right? Um, if not from a writing perspective, um, I think it's very much that. You know, Anne's a perfectly reasonable name. You have no need to be ashamed of it. Meaning, you are sufficient in who you are. Right. And I don't think Marilla is intending it here, but that is, you know, clearly the theme of the book, right? Is that Anne doesn't need to... Um, Anne needs to deal with her problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, her quirkiness and her, um, her uniqueness... There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with Anne, you know, all that stuff. Okay. She's starting to charm Marilla as well. God. Yeah. I mean, A, twist the knife. But also, I want to call out the Japanese voice actress here, how just in this moment she gets really quiet. Yeah. With how much Anne has been chattering and, and going back and forth and her emotional reaction then... In this, this almost negotiation with Marilla about her name and so forth, suddenly she gets like really serious here as Anne is touching on something that's really fundamental. Yeah. Boy. Yeah, she's <clears throat> trying to. I don't know what she's trying to say here, but you know, it's one of those things where it's just like, wouldn't it have been better? to just leave me there and just not do anything and yeah. instead of giving me this false hope mm -hmm. of, you know, yeah. this being home. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, you know, now Matthew is, <laughs> now Matthew's starting to feel that bayonet in the gut twisting mm -hmm. around. Um, but, you know, she's coming, you know, how she has that moment of like, huh, like as if she's going to cry again, but then she's mm -hmm. just like, mm -hmm. as if like this thought came to her head. It's like, well, why, why are you bringing me? Yeah. Why, why did you do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and there's a certain... Going back to the catastrophizing of, you know, um, instead of being taken care of and brought here and being given this sort of emotional heaviness, you know, I would rather be alone. You know, like, imagine Anne sitting on the, in the station alone, uncared for, not knowing who is coming for her and so forth for hours on end. Right? That would have been yeah. as tragic. She would have she would have felt bad there. I mean she probably would have, you know, kept herself her spirits up. But like um she's overemphasizing the present situation. And to be fair fair, uh -huh. that's what kids do. Right? Yes. But also, you know, just got pointing out how she's not seeing the situation clearly. So here we're getting into even more of the themes kind of of the story of what would it take for you to care? Right. Um, with it basically being that, you know, Marilla wants this very specific thing and when she doesn't get that, it's just no, complete rejection. As opposed to, well, here's what you get, you know, with, what are your expectations here? And, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, when you stop and think about what, what Anne's pointing out is like, well, you wanted a boy. I'm not a boy. Mrs. Spencer's taking this beautiful little girl. I'm not beautiful. Yeah. Nobody wants me because I don't fit into any of these yeah. pegs. Into, yeah. in, it, I'm not a peg that's fitting anywhere. Mm -hmm. So tell me what I got to do. Yeah, exactly. Which is which is just as bad. Yeah. You know. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Merla is being very blunt here. On the other hand, you do have to respect Marilla for being straightforward. You know, she's not trying yeah. to paper over it. She's not trying to judge anything. She's not doing what a lot of people would do in the situation, which is, like to your point earlier, you know, send her out of the room and not include her, involve her in any of these conversations and, you know, pretend nothing's happening and then have things happen without her, you know, involvement. She's just like, nope, this is right. what's going on. This is the situation. This is what I want, et cetera. So she's at least clear. And here we're starting to get some sad music. Finally. Right. Um, there's been, I don't think there's been any music in this mm -hmm. episode since they got out of the carriage. No. Uh, very stark, 
just just letting the scene play out. I'm not sure, but Takahata never does anything for no reason. Why is he cutting to the outside with the flowers framed this way? And a flower inside. Mm. Um, is it just to kind of pull us out of that situation and give us time to think? Um, so we're not in the emotional moment? There's a little more um, um, abstract, if you will. Um, is it the growth of Anne? Is it, I don't know. So the what is she used to? She's used to an orphanage, right? Mm-hmm. So she's used to being confined. True. She's gone through this whole magical ride of seeing all these colors, all these things. Because look what's on the outside here is, is yeah. color. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the lavender and all that stuff. Look at what, what's what's going on in the inside of that main room. It's it's very plain, functional, not very pretty. She's closed off from that world now. She's back in her own element of being closed away from what she enjoys, what she wants. That is brilliant. I think you're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Yep. A few things to note here. Uh, this is their dinner. Obviously, Anne has barely touched it. Um, rather understandably. Um, but what is on here? It's meat, potatoes, uh, cherries, and I'm not sure it's underneath the cherries. Maybe like a jello? Maybe. Maybe. Um, but very plain fare. And even by that standards, like, you know, m- you know, this sort of sliced meat is probably not something they have every day. So this is right. something of a celebratory meal. Um, definitely a little bit unusual. Um, also, fairly nice silverware, you know. Um, so communicating a lot about their circumstances. All right, so we've had all of this drama, all of this tenseness, and should just be pointed, be pointed out, we just came back from a commercial break, uh, mm-hmm. the episode, and so we're reminded of the situation, um, and we know Anne's not eating anything, so adding in I'm in the depths of despair, again, lightens it up a little bit, gives us that little bit of over-the-topness, which I think helps to keep us from going completely down to the dumps. <laughs> yeah. Just wanting to turn and switch the channel. Can you imagine that? You're the producer and you watch and you put this thing on it's supposed to be for kids <laughs> and you're just like going, oh my God, you can just see the producer's mind in their minds. They can see all the parents just like, twitch, Zambot. <laughs> We're going to Zambot. <laughs> Not to Zambot, where all the kids have happy lives. There's <laughs> <laughs> Okay, switch to Idiot. Switch to Idiot. Nah. Uh, no. <laughs> I love that shrug. Just like, I don't know. What are you talking about, kid? I am. Uh, Eat your meat and potatoes. Jeez. <laughs> and again, setting up the very different outlooks on life here, where Marilla just cannot relate at all. Okay, now they're they're making another point here which is that despite Anne being in the depths of despair, <laughs> um, she still can't stop talking. <laughs> right. <laughs> and as soon as she gets on to depths of despair, not even a chocolate caramel. Oh, I had a chocolate caramel. Um, there's just this, you know, she just, she's just vivacious, shall we say. All right, and it should be pointed out, it's, you know, um, chocolate caramels are a metaphor for being wanted. Yes. To Anne's defense, she does connect to the fact that she's being rude by not eating her, finishing her dinner, and so she is kind of apologizing that you know, I, please don't be offended. I just literally can't eat. Now, see what Matthew's doing here. There was that quick glance back and forth as he's realizing this is a very uncomfortable situation. Then he basically suggests to Marilla, "This girl needs to go to sleep." <laughs> yeah. She had a long day. Get her to bed. Um, yeah. Appreciate that. I do love how Takahara holds on Matthew. As Anna Marilla leaves. Because you realize here that Matthew is the linchpin of the situation. Right? Marilla's over here. Anne's here. Matthew can be the one to kind of turn Marilla around. 
if he's right. willing and able to do so. Um, you know, will will he get there? So they do an important animation thing here to, to note in terms of how they do this. I just find this kind of interesting. So we have this upper hallway, which is dark because there's no light in it. Then we fade in on this light patch. To do this, what they had to do was take that painting and repaint that section of the painting. So they're oh, literally wow. fading from one background to the next, basically one shot to the next. And then when she comes entirely upstairs, they have a completely different background. They fade in on that. Right. So that you get that effect. Um, it's the only way you can do that with, with a, a background when it's completely hand-drawn. That's how you do that. Okay, this is a little cruel for Marilla to say that she doesn't even trust Anne to put out the candle uh, herself. That said, Marilla's only exposure to Anne has been as this very emotional girl. Right. Um, so she is... She is correct in her uh, um, uh, desire for personal safety. Yes, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) But all of that could have been, to your point, all of that could have been like unsaid. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Go ahead and quickly do it. I'll come back in in just a minute and Mm -hmm. and take take the candle. Not, you're going to burn us down and kill everyone. <laughs> you know, Although to that point, remember remember the, the thing from earlier of the, the girl who poisoned the well? Yes. Maybe there's a yeah. little bit of that in the back of Marilla's mind. Oh, uh, yeah. All right, so we're seeing Anne looking around the room, and we see in one corner a pincushion. So telling us this is clearly like a sewing room of some kind, although there's a bed in it, so it's kind of a multi-purpose room. And going back to her earlier... Uh, talk about uh, having room for imagination you know very spare very empty room you know not much yeah not much space for imagination it's also interesting to me that she looks up um almost like a religious thing you know she's kind of looking upwards towards some savior all right this fascinates me her reaction to looking around the room is this sudden shiver. And I think it's a physiological response to everything that's happened to her at this point. Her body just spasms, basically, in the realization that, like, she's alone, she's not wanted, she can stay the night, and that's fine, but then her future is bleak again. Um, And just having this physical response to that is such an interesting choice here. And she remains very emotional throughout the entire thing here. You can see she's barely holding back tears as she's changing into her nightgown. Uh, And it's fascinating how you had her kind of break down in the kitchen, which was, again, sort of histrionic, sort of over the top. This almost feels like the real emotional hit. Right. Um, Everything really sinks in for her. and This is the real depths of despair. Now, Marilla walks in, and what is her reaction? Yeah, well, I mean, she doesn't know anything about kids, so yeah. she doesn't know that kids are going to do that. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of a thing. So she's shocked. Yeah. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? This is a clean room. Why would you just throw your crap all over? All over mm-hmm. the place? Yeah. <laughs> so here's, to me, the interesting thing. Mm. If she doesn't care, she wouldn't have done that. Any of that. You're absolutely right. You know, a person who does not care who's going to send someone out, what does it matter to you? Yeah. What, you know, you know, even if you are wanting a clean room, even if you are a certain OCD on a certain level, <laughs> um, I, which I don't get the sense from her, yeah. but it, it's, it's kind of like going, well, you know, no, if you're going to be here, your things have a proper place and this is where we put them. Mm-hmm. And this is what all of our parents have done to us. Right, yep. <clears throat> you know, they just like, okay, you're asleep, you're, you know, I'm gonna let you leave, yeah. but you can't leave your crap on the floor. You got to put your foot, your boots over here. You're, we're gonna fold up your shirt and yeah. put it here, and everything's got its little place. So, and you know, even you need if, to know that, even if she is OCD and just has to clean it up, note what she did not do, which is say, why did you leave your stuff around? Right, you know, you should have done something. No, she's like, let her sleep. I'll just put this stuff away for her. Right. Yeah, completely agreed. And here we go. Yep. 
So <laughs> one of the more important moments, I think, in these episodes is the first the kind of surprising reveal of this and I just love how well Takata times it where it's this quiet build up and he just says good night again trying to be nice trying to be polite and Anne just immediately what do you call this yeah um, and getting back to, to that earlier point where Anne has to be her own defender she has to be her own mother so she has to kind of respond back to this to say no <laughs> this is, <laughs> nothing's good about this exactly Marilla is surprised she shouldn't be no right this is a very reasonable reaction but she, you, know, you can tell now she's realizing oh I hurt this kid yeah sound is very important important in this anime you hear her footsteps, you hear the dishes, you hear the smoking, you hear, I mean, you literally can hear the smoking. You can <laughs> hear everything. And it's kind of like that way of just using sound to, to say, okay, this place is supposed to be quiet. Anne's in here and she is loud as F, right? And for good reason. And <clears throat> the, so now everything is keen. Everything is is has a note that has to be played in this in in this episode, so that we understand that. Here's the tension. You're going to hear every single little thing until they start talking again, because if because you need to to focus on what they're going to say next. So this scene is feels important to me. Yeah, 100. percent Marilla's point is, you have to do everything yourself. You can't trust other people can't rely on other people you know um we should have done this ourselves yeah don't know about that yeah also notice how takahata is framing them they are opposite you know mm -hmm. which also tells us that you know, marilla is like well not gonna happen gotta fix this tomorrow morning and matthew's not thinking the same way boy is marilla convinced of her own rightness yeah um, you know not only do you have to agree with me you have to agree with me to the exact same level of intensity that I feel it mm. and getting back to her earlier point you know Matthew established that love for her that you know I don't want her to leave because not because of how unfortunate that would be but because I want her to feel good I want her to feel safe yeah. and protected, um, and so he's still keyed up, keyed in on that. Where it's it's not it's pretty center back because it's not her fault. It's she is so set on staying here. I want that for her, and so what Matthew is doing here is, I don't know, not quite offering a, a an olive branch, but he's temporalizing a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And it's like he's trying to leave the options on the table by agreeing with her, but saying, well, I suppose, well, maybe. Uh, keeping that gray space in the conversation, if you will. Because he can't just say no. He can't just say, here's right. the other option. But he just keeps on insisting that, well, maybe, the, maybe this isn't the, the final decision. There, there it is. We there we go. Um, she asks, what good, what good would you be to us? And he is, we might be some good to her. Oh, <laughs> that's some good writing. It should also be pointed out that Matthew doesn't really have the words to describe what it is that Anne you know, does to him. Um, right. You know, he, he, he doesn't have a, a logical argument. He just keeps going back to, like, she's just interesting. Um, and... I appreciate that even though he can't mount an argument here, he still doesn't completely back down. Now, this is clearly true. <laughs> yes. Like, we get a very clear sense that Marilla does not need company, right? Um, yet. Right? You know, at this point in her life, she does not need company. No. Um, not in the least. Why and would you want to be that company? Right, you know, <laughs> she, she does not seem like the uh, the the most amazing company in the world. To your point, sound. 
just the dishes, just that. Um, Matthew has basically given up the argument at this point. That it's just as you say, goes off to bed. And we get this full face of her frown um, to point out that there's still an opposition. And again, they have not been looking at each other. I mean, they looked at each other briefly, but they're still at loggerheads separate. Right, yeah. For those of you familiar with Anne of Green Gables, you know what this means. This is an important uh, call forward, if you will, to a plot point that recurs frequently in Anne of Green Gables is Marilla's headaches. Um, Mm -hmm. So we're getting the first of them here. Also, not unreasonable after tonight. (laughs) Yeah, no joke. (laughs) Notice something here. Matthew is still awake. Mm -hmm. So is Marilla. So, you know, neither of them are comfortable with this idea that we have to send Anne back in the morning. Still running around their heads. Not only does Takahata do this interesting thing of like, quick flashing back and forth between her and the um, cherry blossoms to make us you know, think about that, but notice what's different now. These are not the cherry blossoms from before. Now it's at night. Now it's dark. Right? It's almost like the cherry trees are fading away. Yeah. Because they literally are. It should also be pointed out here. Um... This was on a different background before, right? All the bright mm-hmm. lights. So they had to literally take all of those frames of animation, take a new background, Jeez. and reanimate that entire thing, you know, re-expose re, re, uh, right. that entire sequence just to get this different shot. Ah, all of it. Like, they basically reanimated the entire... Well, they didn't reanimate, but they refilmed the entire sequence just to point out that... Now she's in her dream. It's a it's a darker dream now. All right, now it should be pointed out because Takahata is not a jerk. <laughs> what we get next immediately is the next episode preview, which is explicit acknowledgement that next episode is going to be better. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to take your heart and crush it and squeeze it and just mangle it. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh God! And so you know, the, it was a slog. I mean, from beginning to end of this episode, it was yeah. it was definitely an emotional slog. I mean, it's just we had to build up. We know what's going to happen, then it happens, and we're just like going, "Oh my God!" Nobody in this building is emotionally equipped to <laughs> yeah, exactly. deal with this situation. <laughs> You know, and you're just like, you're like, oh, my God. So you're almost grateful for when the narrator shows up and starts going, so, you know, know, they're unhappy. and Thank you, narrator, because everything else was just getting to be too much. And, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's it's just a slog. I mean, it's just it's like, you know, here's the nail. Not good. Not good. Sad, sad, sad. Not good. And you, but that's the point is that you're supposed to feel the despair. Like she keeps saying despair, and and even though there's funny points to it, and, yeah. you know, or lighthearted moments to it, there's de- you're definitely not supposed to feel like, hey, you know, you're <laughs> you're just gonna be just like, oh please, please do something, somebody somewhere, <laughs> anywhere, yeah. do something, <laughs> let her win the lottery, something, anything. Well, and you think structurally. You know, you know you're going to have this sequence. Right. You know, we have to have the, 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 the down. And if Takahata had... Like, imagine if we, we got to the end of the episode halfway through that, ep- that, that sequence. No one would tune into episode three. Right. So you have to just condense it all into one episode and just let it ride. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think it would be easy to rush this um, and to skip to the next morning where Anne's feeling better and so forth. I think a lesser director would have um, you know, it's a very natural episode progression to Anne shows up, dramatic reveal, all this kind of stuff. She goes to sleep and then she wakes up the next morning and ah, she feels better. Credits. You know, right. you get kind of that, that, that denouement. But no, I think that Takahata is like emotionally, 
it makes more sense for us to stay in that for the entire thing and then get the the moment of hope at the end if you will um instead yeah. of trying to artificially just make us feel happy just because you know Right. Well, you know, you see that in a lot of anime today where it's just like, okay, we have to, we got 50 episodes, guys, and we got to get through this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so let's get the, let's get the depressing thing out of the way and like, you know, have the happy, happy, joy, joy at the end of the the video or at the end of the episode. And, you know, so you don't have that emotional investment of why all of this is so important right Mm -hmm. so usually in in anime today you have that serious moments and stuff but then there's the goofy light-hearted someone trips over and pie in the face right whatever and and, you know then things become better and people are happier and then we'll we'll find the way we'll do the thing and find the way this entire episode is literally no solution is actually given to you to us you're right right absolutely right no solution and we and we're in limbo and the thing is is that what he did brilliantly here is think about the last time you were in a massive argument with somebody where you were just in an emotional argument and you're angry and you're all that and at the end of it when it's done especially if there's no resolution what do you feel you feel freaking tired you know you're exhausted you're exhausted by the end of this episode (laughs) right because you're dealing with all this with no resolution and you just get to the end of it and you're just like oh god yes please everyone go to sleep and then and then smartly they have the reveal at the end of the episode of going okay it's a new day so here's some bright colors for you and Anne is smiling so you know <laughs> please watch next week so, so please, please watch <laughs> next week it's going to be happy we, 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 please please believe us but it yeah. does give you uh, again, smartly, they, the way they did it is that they, the, when they don't give you that resolution, of course you're going to watch next week because you want to know how they got from I'm staring at the ceiling not knowing what to do to Anne's happy. How did yeah. we get from that to that? Mm-hmm. And that's really the thing is, you know, to get you to go, okay, okay, please, I want to see the happy. Mm-hmm. Give yeah. me the happy. You know, so. And to your point, I think a lot of modern anime, a lot of entertainment in general, they want you to feel whatever they think you should feel in a given moment. They want the correct number of positive and negative moments in an episode to kind of make it all all work. Instead, what Takahata says is, Anne is sad for this entire episode. I want you to feel sad for the entire period where she sat. Yes. You know, I, you are in Anne's emotional space for this, really, that past two episodes fully. Um, as opposed to, well, we're just going to, you know, give you a um, wacky animal stumbling over itself, you know, ha, ha, ha. Right. Um, it just, it, it all is of the, the the same piece it all comes together to make you feel what you should feel um given the emotional weight of the character yeah um yeah it's a lot um and again Anne has had this really traumatic experience um especially given what you know, if you've, you know, read the book or whatever, you know, you, you know that she's, she's been, I, I forget the term, but it's like not fostered, but she's been, I guess it's fostered. She's, she's been with other families, you know, off and on, um, but not actually adopted. And so right. there's never been that, you know, acceptance or that sense of acceptance. This is, this is not like that. This isn't, you know, you're going to go live with these, these, this family for a while. Um, it is, I have my one chance and it's been ripped away from me. Um, by somebody who clearly is not connecting with me on an emotional level. Yeah. Mm. Marilla, God, <laughs> read a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To that point, um, do you think Marilla did any preparation for this? 
It, what do you mean, preparation for? For having for... a child in the house. <laughs> no, no. I, I think the closest the preparation that she had was the dinner. The dinner was supposed to be for a boy. So they had the nice dinner to welcome what they thought was going to be coming their way. Yep. And that's really the only preparation. Look at that room. The, there's nothing going on in that room. Yeah. You know, here's the bed. And here's a table in the corner with a push push pin. And, you know, they're fun with that. Yeah. You know, there's no books. There's no. Well, that's the other thing. There are no books. There are no games. There are no. Um, there's nothing there to um, entice a child to be there, to want to be there. You know, it's it's a very plain room. It's, you know, you know, almost like, you know, here's your gruel, right? You know, <laughs> like kind of a thing. Yeah. And, you know, so, no, she. I, I think at best they're, like, going, well, we're going to do a celebratory dinner for the boy, and then we're going to work his butt, you know, kind of a thing. And because mm-hmm. that's really where they're at, their headspace is at. Yeah. Matthew, towards the end, actually comes to an idea of what maybe should be happening next. Mm-hmm. Although it's at an incredibly glacial pace, but you know, he's, he's getting there. Yeah, he's getting there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, no, totally. And you see how they live their lives, right? Plain dress, plain living. Um, you know, they don't have. Uh, you know, you look at the patterns on their china, and it's nice. You know, it's pretty, but it's not like you know little little. Um, painted flowers all over them or anything like that. You know, it's, it's very straightforward and very, very work a day. And when they eat a meal, not a lot of conversation going along, not a lot of how is your day, right? Just very right. plain and simple. And that's how they think a child's going to be. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Especially not nope. this one. No. <laughs> Love how she is. Yeah, well, I figured out that she was a chatterbox. It's just like, going, <laughs> yeah, get used to that. Uh huh. Oh boy. Um. Do you think? So, what do you think actually here of of the pace of these episodes? Do you think going like so deep into these episodes, like how? How has that affected this <clears throat> compared to, and we're watching Gundam episodes where tons mm-hmm. of things happen in each episode and we're jumping forward hours uh, between individual scenes, you know, and a lot of stuff happening. What do you think the effect of this pace has, ha- has been on this show? Well, you know, the, it's a sort of realism. Um, yeah. And insofar, you know, it's kind of weird to say because it's Anne's imagination for about a good 40 to 50 percent of it. (laughs) But, uh, you know, but it's almost I wouldn't say happening in real time, but it's just it's just, you know, if you look at the clock on the on the episodes, 25 minutes, does it feel like 25 minutes? No, it most certainly does not. Mm -hmm. It feels much, much longer, particularly the second episode for obvious reasons. It's just emotionally, you know, damaging through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But the pace, what, what the pace is, is doing is that it's taking place of dialogue and it's taking place Mm -hmm. of, of um you know various things that you would need to know so like in gundam you know like what we've been looking at things have to be explained to a certain degree and you have to have these different things coming in you have to have the dialogue of you know why is this that we have a flashback blah, 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 blah. here we can let takahara just go we see the enormity of um Anne's imagination as she's taking this right because Remember, first episode is literally her going from the tra- part of it is the train station, and the rest of it is the train station to not even Grand Green Gables. Yeah, right, right, right. So, so you're going through there, and you're learning through them through this chatterbox and this one guy who just you know just is so painfully slow with his words, <laughs> and, and you know, and they're two, but but that's on purpose. You know, they're diametrically opposed in terms of of verbosity, and. So this is a learning curve for the audience to get invested into these people and get invested in Anne and the way that Takahara 
uses sound and uses sight and you know to to make Matthew more important almost yeah. and by the time that we get to the end of the second episode where we see that Matthew has kind of already made up his mind yeah mm-hmm. and he's and and it's really not about him deciding whether or not he wants the girl here mm-hmm. it's how he's going to get the girl keep the girl here yeah. he knows that Marilla is going to be a problem mm-hmm. and then compounded with the fact of Marilla who actually is the second most v- verbose person which is not much <laughs> and you know compared to Anne but you know it's just this ama- amazing just like here is your world in this show yeah and you, we're going to explain it to you not by telling you but by showing you what's going on here how many times did we hear the narrator yeah I mean, like, in the in the second twice, one maybe? in the second yeah. episode like twice yeah yeah everything else is just watch 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 pay attention pay attention so these episodes feel like they're like 40 minutes long and i I tell you and but by the end of it (laughs) you know a lot Mm -hmm. a lot 100 percent um it's also interesting to me how much they're setting up um what Anne's experience might be like with marilla and matthew you know most anyone can guess where this is going to go, right? That she's going to end up staying right. with them. But you also get the sense that, well, this isn't going to be a picnic even if she stays. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's this interesting kind of um, uh, approach to it of, hmm, let's see, let's see where, that, where that goes. Um, it's also remarkable given, you know, you think about all of this stuff. And again, if, you, if you're all familiar with Anna Green Gables, you know the, the friends <coughs> she makes all the various stuff kind of going on in in Avonlea. Um, we get no hint of any of that yet. We're still staying mm-hmm. very much in this situation and waiting for all of that to, to appear. You know, we mentioned this, you know, Diana, um, you know, in there. We have not seen a frame of that girl anywhere. Um, oh. We're, we're, we're and, and again, I think it's Takahata's brilliance of saying, also, this is a show for kids. I'm not going to overwhelm you with detail. We need. I'm overwhelming you with emotion. <laughs> yeah. You know. <coughs> and how. You know. We need to focus how. on that and help you understand where all these characters are coming from. Man. Um, God. If this if this was a drinking game on how many times Anne would talk. <laughs> face first, down on the floor by now. Before the first commercial break of the first episode, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, she's a she's a chatterbox. Now, to that point, it should be pointed out like a lot of Anne's more outre personality traits are a direct reaction to the experiences she's had, right? Right. Uh, so that that sort of chatterbox thing is um, because she has been so socially isolated. Right, it's it's how she kind of keeps herself interested and 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 engaged. Right, is just constantly talking and keeping a even a one-sided conversation going is better than the, you know, complete lack of 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 um, um, exposure to simulation that she has had. Um, yeah. So you, you can see in so many of her personality traits those things kind of coming out a little bit, like that defensiveness she has, um, where those are, th- those are things that she probably needs to buff out a little bit on her personality, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it's understandable given where she's coming from. Yeah, yeah. Um, any final thoughts? It's, it's episode? Just like, just like at, at this point, it's... One of the things that, that that you're gonna have to deal with in the first couple of episodes of Anne is this like, poor girl is starved for color, sound, anything, and when she, and that is her reaction to all that because, otherwise you might almost see her like like, right eye go in one direction and like start <laughs> bleeding out the ear because ah sensory overload I gotta express you know, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> you know. But re- no, honestly, like this is part of like who she is—is is that she has to express every, 
everything is on her sleeve, just about. Yeah. And, you know, and she's putting it out there, and she's just like, somebody pick it up, because I, I, I have no capacity to hold it in. That's a great point, too, where th- there's also a certain um, desire for attention in that way, in that yeah. sort of socially acceptable way of, like, she's just so hungry for anyone to care for her. And yeah. constantly talking is potentially a way for people to engage her and to at least get some attention from somebody. Um, but her being a smart girl who reads a lot and so forth and so on, she's picked up that that is a way to be to do that in a socially acceptable way. I think you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, that's a, that's an episode where there's a lot to talk about. I would say. Um, yes. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> just a few things. Just 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 a few things. So uh, <laughs> be curious to see how episode three works out. Oh yes, yes indeed. I hopefully I don't ball. <laughs> hopefully I don't ball. All right. I hope you found that useful. I know I did uh, a lot to unpack in that episode. And uh, good news is we're all ready to go for the festival. I've got everything documented all right in one place. So as soon as she shows... Watch more anime.